So it's my pleasure to interview today uh, someone who um, I've had the pleasure of knowing for uh, 27 years and many consider to be uh, the smartest person in real estate in Canada, bar none. John Love is the founder and CEO of Ca uh, Kingset Capital, Canada's leading private equity real estate investment firm co-investing co with institutional and ultra high net worth clients. Founded in 2002, Kingset has completed over $50 billion in transactions and currently manages $17.5 billion in assets within its family of funds. John began his real estate career with Oxford Properties in 1980, becoming president in 1987 and CEO in 1992. He led Oxford's IPO in 1995 and oversaw $7 billion in acquisitions over the ensuing six years. Oxford was then acquired by the Ontario Municipal Employees Retirement System, otherwise known as OMERS, in 2001 in a $4 billion privatization. John is a member of the Business Council of Canada, among other organizations, and an advisory board member at the Ivy Business School, where he earned an honors degree in business administration. He was awarded an honorary doctorate from Western in 2016 and became a member of the Order of Canada in 2018. John also received several other awards earlier this year, including the Ivy Business Leader of the Year and the NAOP Rex Icon. So please join me in welcoming John. Thanks for taking the time to uh, be here today, John. So let's, let's begin our conversation with the beginning of your uh, professional career. Your first full-time job actually wasn't in real estate. So can you tell us a little bit about what happened after you graduated from Western and take us through your career path uh, that eventually led to real estate with the final question being why did you end up moving into real estate? Well, thank you, George. And, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to be here today. And, and uh, hopefully over the next hour, we can have some fun and maybe some takeaways. Um, you know, my personal journey, uh, you know, I went to business school at Western, uh, my fourth year that everybody's interviewing on, on campus. There's two things that I decided I would never do. One was I wouldn't be a stockbroker. Secondly, I'd never work for Oxford because my father had started Oxford. So like those were hardwired. So anyways, as we're, <clears throat> I, I find out that all my classmates were getting jobs and I actually didn't have one yet. Um, and uh, uh, I ended up interviewing with a uh, retail stock brokerage firm, Scotia McLeod, and they were smart enough to send their number one salesperson uh, to do the recruiting. So I go into this 60 minute meeting and come out with, you know, the tablets coming down from right. mom. I'm going to be a retail stock broker. So, um, I joined Scotia McLeod in 1976, and when I started, you'll like this, when I started, there was no computers, right? So um, it was a metal desk, a dial phone, you remember? Those, you, you know, you know. Anyway, um, and, uh, and on I went, and it was a, it was a magical uh, four years for me. Um, and, and, I, and I would say observation number one is, is, you know, when thinking of a career, sometimes taking a job is just taking a job, and it was great for me, and I learned... Um, you know, a, a huge amount in those four years uh, about uh, how to communicate with people, how to listen to people, how to, you know, cold calls, very scary stuff. Anyway, uh, so I did that for four years and at the, um, or almost five years, so at the age of 26, uh, I thought uh, in my binary thinking of the time, did I want to do that for 39 more years, you know, because I assumed you work till you're 65 and then you don't, um, and decided, you know, I, I want to do something different. So then I, I went to see my father. And I said, you know, uh, maybe a job at Oxford. And remember the two things I wouldn't do? Anyway, um, so he said, go talk to a guy. And so I went and talked to a guy. And, and uh, I wanted to be a development guy in Calgary because that was red hot at the time, 1980. Um, he said, well, we had got a leasing coordinator job in Toronto. And, of course, Toronto was in 1980, sort of like, why, why would you go there? Anyway, um, but I did that. And uh, it was uh, then began the next phase of my career. And the difference between 
As a retail stockbroker, uh, you're communicating with people about their investment objectives and you're trying to curate a stock portfolio or whatever. In the real estate business, it's totally different. It's everything about creativity. It's everything about solving somebody else's problem. Listening, which means A, listening to the problem, and then B, trying to come up with a solution. Um, and so I found it infinitely more uh, intellectually interesting. I was always curious and I found that super interesting. And, you know, I had the good fortune to um, actually be a pretty good, you know, communicator. So my job, I mean, when I started, I reported to a guy who reported to a guy who reported to a guy who once met my father, right? So I was well down the food chain, um, which was appropriate. Um, and uh, over time, uh, you know, I built, uh, you know, up my career. I went to St. Paul, Minnesota, went to Calgary, back to Toronto. Uh, in a leadership role, um, and then um, was in a leadership role at the end of the 80s, which was a very high time, and then became CEO when my father left the business in 1992, uh, which was a very low time. Um, and uh, it was actually a super interesting um, time. The world was as bad as you can imagine. Uh, all of the leaders in the industry, which was not Oxford at the time, uh, were going into you know, CCAA, um, everybody was afraid. No one could make interest payments. I mean, the whole, everything was a mess. Um, but I was, I was young, naive, and broke. Perfect set of facts. And so uh, with those set of facts, uh, and assembled a great leadership team, uh, and, and we stood up to the challenge of what seemed like insurmountable odds. We were heavily discounted. Um, but we're able to use, build relationships, transparency, and trust, which is all those things are the currency of the real estate business, um, to uh, solve other people's problems. And, and as we were able to do that, we built the business, ultimately went public in, in 95 with a $50 million market cap. Um, and, uh, you know, we had tens of thousands of dollars in the bank. Our first big acquisition was a billion dollar one. Um, it was an interesting, you know, evolution built Oxford to uh, a position of leadership and then sold it to Omers. Um, and and uh, there I was at the age of 47. Uh, our youngest child had just gone off to university, so we were thankfully empty nesters. Um, and it took six months off and went dark. And when I say went dark, I left Oxford. No forwarding email address, no forwarding phone number, and it's going dark. And for six months, we were off the radar screen, traveled and did stuff like that with my wife our 25th wedding anniversary year. Anyway, it was super cool. Um, and then came back and started uh, King Set. Um, and, you know, the King Set story was basically I, um, I would uh, it started off with my coffee shop meetings. And the reason the business was named King Set is the coffee shops had to have two, right? You can't operate out of one coffee shop because it looks like you're loitering. So um, you have to have two, one on either side of the street, King Street. And um, so I would put on my coat, walk across the street, take off my coat. I'd tip the people on both sides not to sit, recognize me and never say, would you like another coffee? Because, you know, that you didn't want to look like you're, again, loitering. Anyway, <clears throat> so um, as I used my ears, not my mouth, I listened to where there was an opportunity. And all of the large Canadian pension funds, which whom I had a relationship, had an allocation for uh, an opportunity fund in real estate in Canada. Um, but there was no execution vehicle. So I thought, well, maybe I could do that. And hence the start of King Set. Um, and they were kind enough to support that. And, and that was the beginning of, of the business. And uh, I assembled a team, raised the money, assembled a team, and away I went. And, uh, you know, people have been very, you know, stakeholders and others have been very kind to me over a long period of time, including my young friend here, over a long period of time. Um, and it's been terrific. I should tell one George story. So. So it's, it's uh, starting King Set. And of course, nobody knows what it is. Nobody knows what you're doing. Um, George is running the real estate forums. And I said, George, I need to be as a speaker on the real estate forums in Toronto and Vancouver and Calgary, you know, the, the larger ones, because, I, you know, we've got to seem like we're relevant, right? And if you're a speaker, somebody thinks you're relevant. And so I leaned on my, my friend here. And so he said, OK, I'll, I'll do that. Um, cause when you're a little startup business, you're kind of irrelevant. Um, anyway, so that was super helpful in building our business and George was very kind doing that. Thanks John. But you know, it takes two, uh, you were 
unquestionably in all instances ranked as one of the top speakers at those conferences. So it's a two-way street. Uh, I'd like to go back to the recession for a minute and uh, focus in on uh, what went on at that particular time because I think that if I may say so, I don't not sure that there's very many people here in the room who've ever seen a very significant recession. You know, you hear a little bit about rumblings that there might be a recession happening within the next month or two or whatever. But I'd like to get John to talk a little bit more about what happened in 1989 that some people view lasted, are you ready for this, until 1994. This wasn't some little hiccup. It was, uh, it was something much more substantial. And there's one other little aspect to uh, draw into this. Interestingly enough, a number of issues that have been discussed publicly in the last year or so were actually top of mind 30 years ago. And I'll give you these examples. Telecommuting was the key buzzword for many people who worked from home with the belief that they had at that time that so many were happy working at home that there would never be one more square inch of new office space built in downtown Toronto ever. Second thing, the core at one point reached a 20% vacancy rate among the office sector. And so guess what many people suggested? Why aren't some of these empty buildings turned into multi-residential? Have you heard that recently? And there was a belief that downtown Toronto was permanently losing its luster as a third item. So John, with those points, if we could move forward over the, from that recession and then over the next three decades, what actually happened since the recession ended? And what key trends would you say were responsible for the fact that the downtown became what it is in, or what it was in 19, uh, sorry, in 2019, just prior to the pandemic? Yeah, so um, maybe I'll split, uh, you know, I'll tease out a couple of stories because I think it sort of illustrates, um, you know, so what it was like. First of all, if you go back to the end of 1989, you know, the world was on fire, everything, everybody was making money, everybody was taking excess risk, all those sorts of things were going on. And then, the, you know, the market uh, materially decelerated as there was a recession, higher interest rates, so on and so forth. So, um, and to understand what it was like, you really had to be in a P&L position. To understand a recession, you had to be in a P&L position where you're responsible for profit and loss in 1991-92, uh, which means you probably have to be 60 years old today. And as I look around the room, you know, with all respect, I've got t-shirts older than most of you. So, um, as, as you go back, here's what it was like. So it was August uh, or July 3rd, 1992. The first time we couldn't make an interest payment on a mortgage. Um, and that's a terrifying spot. So I got, I got in a cab, see the lender, it was a life company on Blair Street. It went in to see uh, the chief investment officer who I'd never met before. And I was terrified. And um, they, uh, because I had to tell them we couldn't make the interest payment that was due the next day. Um, and, uh, but it, they did own some office buildings that were managed by a third party. Uh, well, okay, so I went in to see him. I said, look, we, can, we can't make our interest payment, and this is why. Um, but you do manage or own some office buildings managed by someone else. If we could manage them, we could take half those management fees and um, help to pay the interest. It's the only thing I could think of. So um, as I leave, he says to me, thanks. Now, most important thing you can do in your career is to listen for signals. So he said, thanks. I stopped. And I said, thanks. And he said, John, we have three kinds of borrowers. The first kind, borrow money, pay us back. We like them the most. The second kind, borrow money, have a problem, and are not open with us, not candid with us, not transparent with us, or try to hurt our collateral, and we go out of our way to hurt them. <laughs> Hoping there's a third kind. He says, the third kind, borrow money, have a problem, come in and tell us what it is, are open with us, and come up with some solutions. 
or some ideas on how to deal with it. We work with them and we'll work with you. And that single moment defined how Oxford survived the travails of 92, 3, 4 when so many other people didn't. Because the secret was to be, because he told me right there, uh, to be open, transparent, constructive, have some ideas, have some skin in the game, do all sorts of things, which is what we did with the other dozen lenders we couldn't pay interest to. So um, that, was, that was the story then. Now, of course, we, we then worked out a deal in August of 1992 with our prime lender, which sort of stabilized the business. And, and it, got, it got, we separated the management company from the assets, and so the management company was sort of set up so it would be cash flow neutral, which is a win, okay? So by November, I learned a lesson, which is a concept called working capital. Now, it turns out that as we were growing, we had to put some capital, you know, you have to put some money in as you grow, right? Um, and we didn't have any money. And, and it was at that point I had to go put a mortgage on my house to make payroll. Um, and that's a relatively um, refreshing moment in anyone's life, uh, especially when I had to go to my wife and say, because she has to sign the mortgage, right? Um, and she's got to get independent legal counsel. So she goes and gets independent legal counsel. And, of course, the lawyer says to her, you know, he could do anything he wants with this money, like take off with his secretary. And she says, well, I've met his secretary. What else? <laughs> um, and, and, uh, but, you know, it does, it does bring home, you know, uh, commitment. Um, so anyway, we took the mortgage and, uh, you know, we got over that hump, working capital, super interesting, which shows you that every business plan is perfect until you execute it. Um, and uh, because every path has you know, things in it you can't contemplate. Anyway, um, but the other, the other interesting thing from a leadership perspective was people were afraid. And they were justifiably afraid. 1993, um, a company called um, Markboro Properties, very big company, much bigger than Oxford. Um, you know, it's a, it's a warm summer day in August. Employees go out, you know, for lunch. A lot of people leave their jackets at their desk, whatever. Um, the lenders lock the doors at noon. So they come back and they can't get in. So then they have to fill out a form, go in, get a box, take their stuff and leave, no severance, right? So my guys, I got 160 people or 180 people that at that point, that's 160 families, 180 families are wondering what to do. Your leadership style has to be structurally different. You have to be transparent. You have to recognize the challenges. You have to communicate to people what the vision is, what the expectation for them is, and what the goal is, um, which uh, was uh, a learning process for me. Remember, I, I, got, I got no experience in this, right? And so I, I'm feeling it out as I go. But it's all about values. And so with that, we really had um, you know, a high-energy organization. And our method was, you know, we're not going to lose. Um, as we got into 94, September 94, it was the first time in five years when in our budget reviews, our leasing volume was higher than budget. First time in five years. That tells you the market had turned. Again, listening. You could see the market had turned. Not rental rates, they were still terrible. But velocity always precedes rate increases. So you knew all the recovery was gonna go on. And, and, <clears throat> and we thought, well, as basically a management business, uh, we would be sitting on the curb uh, and not take any advantage of that. So we said, we, we got to recapitalize. So we got to find a capital source. So this was spectacular. So I start with the Canadian pension plans, all of whom say, we will never again invest in real estate. Then I went to Wall Street, and those guys are super scary um, because they were all kids with laptops that were telling you, well, if you renege on this loan and you screw this tenant, you'll get an IRR of that. You know, like we, we would provide capital on that basis. Terrifying. So then through happenstance, I get introduced to, uh, you know, a guy from Hong Kong. Wonderful guy. Um, and it was one of those breakfasts where I sort of walked away and said, did I do all the talking? Because everything seemed to go so well. Um, uh, but in fact, he was highly aligned with what it was we were trying to do. And we spent the next six months dating because he would end up with majority control of the company.
So I had to make sure the social side was right. So I went to Hong Kong. He went to toured our properties. We spent a lot of time on the plane. And like, who were you when you were 15? And, you know, what's the first time you had a car accident? I mean, it's, it, you know, trying to figure out, could we have a social? Um, and um, in December, we decided we'd make that work. Now, the narrow issue was the company of which I sold them wasn't exactly what Oxford was, was like, right? Okay, so we would have to get some other people, stakeholders, to agree to certain things. And there was basically 12 negotiations at the same time, each of whom wanted one-tenth of the pie. And, of course, you know, 10 divided by 12 is not one, right? So um, anyway, um, so we, we, we went through all of that process and got it all done by June. And, and then uh, one of the Canadian chartered banks said, we've changed our mind. We're not going to do that. Huh. And this is the guy I'm dealing with. And like, I do something that you never want to do. I called the CEO of the bank. And I said, I need to come see you. And it was a Friday afternoon in June. Unfortunately, my relationship guy had to go to his cottage. So it was just me and the CEO. Perfect. So I'm with the CEO. And I give him my pitch, and it's good. And he says, John, he says, you know, um, uh, it's not personal. This is just business, and I can't do that deal. And I said, sir, this isn't business. This is my life. I still get choked up. I, you know, it's a, it's, it's a remarkable time. So I went through the spiel again. And really the same spiel, but maybe with a little more gesticulation. Anyway, within 20 minutes, he finally said, look, it's 4.30, it's sunny outside, it's a Friday, I'll do that deal. And with that, the whole Oxford story started. So, um, and it's, it's a lesson in persistence. It's a lesson in no is just where the conversation starts. Um, it's a lesson in um, being respectful, being candid, because I showed them all our vulnerabilities. And I, I should say with my Chinese, my Hong Kong partner, wonderful guy, but as we went through all of this period, while everybody, I'm trying to get everybody in a box, nothing went exactly according to plan. And I kept telling them, here's what's happened. Um, and, you know, you could do this or you could do that. And best practice would be if you do something in the middle. And that's what he did. Because he also recognized, the counterparty recognized, that the relationship was more important than the next nickel. Um, and so uh, at the end of the day, they put their money in in July of 95, and in the exit in, in 01, uh, they got 5x return. Um, and uh, it was a remarkable journey. Was that the question? I forget. No, oh, that was a, that was it was a, a good story. Th no, it was a great story, John. A great story. I'll tell you a couple Just of the stories while we're here. So as I'm leaving the brokerage business, um, and I remember, uh, you know, I had good fortune. I, I actually built a big business in, in the 20s. And I was, um, by the time I was 24, I was top five salesman in Scotia McLeod's national system. And I was that for three years. Um, and uh, which was remarkable for someone that knows nothing. Because I, I knew nothing about the stock market, really. I mean, you can't, you, you can't have any experience when you're 24 or 5. Um, and when I left... Uh, I went to see my largest account. It was the largest individual account at that point for Scotia in Western Canada. And um, I, I was in Edmonton. So, so I said to him, why did you deal... The first time I'd had the nerve to say to them, why did you deal with me? And he said, it's because you care about my money more than I do. Just process that. This is a gift someone's giving to me, which is the gift he's giving to me is to say... What's the secret of success? I cared about the other party. He felt I cared about him. He felt I thought he was important. You care about my money more than I do. What a gift. And, you know, my business career is all based on having gifts like that through my, through my life because, you know, I've been able to process them. I've been able to hear them. I've asked sometimes some tough questions. People have given me Good answers. And so those things are super important. Um, anyway, when we did the marathon deal, the first deal with Oxford, it was a billion dollar transaction. Um, we're doing a joint venture with, with uh, GE, 500 each. Uh, we need $150 million of equity. And, and at the time, Oxford's market cap was 50 million. It actually started off at 100, became 50. So the story goes, when we, when we closed the IPO in, um, in July of 
95. It's a $100 million market cap, and our investor had put in $60 million for 60% of the business. Uh, it had only taken me nine months to cut that in half. So in nine months, the stock price had gone from five to 250. So I went over to Hong Kong, and I was nervous. Um, and I, you know, because I wanted to sort of say, talk to the lead shareholder. So uh, he, he picks me up at the airport at midnight. I'd flown economy, you know, I don't know, 16 hours, all that stuff. Um, and, uh, and I said to him, you know, I feel, uh, I feel badly how the stock's done. I mean, the stock, you know, the company's done a little bit better than we thought, but the stock price has been a real disappointment. And he said to me, John, you look after the company and the stock will look after itself. And again, you process what that means, which is the right answer, by the way. So the next day I'm in his office telling him about this prospective marathon acquisition. You know, a billion dollars, our half would be 500 million. Uh, I would need him to backstop $150 million of equity because I didn't know if we could raise it in the public markets. Spent two hours, went through it, <clears throat> the strategy and everything else. He said, I'll do that. Boom. Got on the plane, went home. Did the marathon transaction, so on and so forth. So at the exit in, uh, in 01, you know, I, I did go and say to him, Charles, you know, like that was the pivotal, you know, the next the real builder for, for Oxford. Um, why did you do that? And he said, John, it's because I trusted you. Full stop. And again, it's, it's you know, if I could stress anything for young people, as you think about your career going forward, the only asset you have and that can endure are your values. And if you treat the other people, if you build a relationships, deal with, you know, have real values, uh, treat people with respect, solve problems, you know, uh, you're open, transparent, and so on and so forth. Actually, that's the toolkit that has all the value because nothing else does. What it says in your business card is transitory because you might be uh, whatever today and you might be unemployed tomorrow, it doesn't matter. But the values are what you own and that's what you can curate. curate. And the values is what, are what create all of your own financial value. Really interesting, John. Uh, just going back to one aspect. To the question you asked? No, no, the, the, the very last uh, comment that I made and I want to bring it forward um, over the next um, uh, 18 years. So there was a belief through that recession that the downtown was hammered and that the downtown would never see the light of day. The okay, way it so let me go. So, so, so and, and, sorry, and, 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 yeah. then, and then we have that same conversation starting up again now that the downtown is losing its vitality, luster, and so on right. and so forth. What do you say to people who have this particular perspective? Well, um, you know, journalists have to compete for airtime. We all know what clickbait is. And other than this young lady here who's going to be perfectly transparent and, and perfectly uh, open and honest with a... Um, but so what... So with, and it's been heightened with social media, and it was super heightened during COVID. Um, where, where people could uh, say things and circulate things that sound more and more outrageous. People will never go back to a city, they'll never go back to an office, they'll never sit in a classroom again, you know, and, and all those things. Um, and at the end of the day, um, the most important thing is you got to have a lens of stay calm and carry on. Because it's never as good as it seems, and it's never as bad as it seems. And the same people that were, uh, would have been saying in, in you know, 2019, Toronto's going to the moon forever. Some, of, some different people say that, you know, the downtown's dead. And I, to those people, I sort of say, I wonder if they've been downtown, right? Um, because I actually live not far from here and I work not far from here. Um, and and seems like there's a lot of people to me. Um, I, I think uh, a city is an evolving and thriving organ, right? And it is always morphing and evolving and changing. And, and those are all, you know, constructive things. COVID was an outlier because for a year or for 18 months, everybody was, you know, locked in their basement, um, which, um, and, you know, that's sort of done and, you know, we all move on. But the fact is, 
people are a social animal. The reason Toronto is such a strong city is because it's the financial and technology center and, and education center for the country. And the reason technology is so uh, such a big growth driver here is you've got a combination of large scale educational institutions, large scale customers, i.e. the financial institutions, um, and a enormously um, burgeoning technology center, which is supported with a very progressive uh, immigration strategy, which welcomes people from the, around the world and, and, and views people on their talents, uh, not their place of origin. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that, you know, the, the vacancy today in, in office space, you know, it's a headline, but it's boring because the fact is that we're at the end of a development cycle. Uh, we thought vacancy, if you asked us in 2019, we would have said vacancy today would be 12%. Well, it's 15, big deal. Um, the biggest issue that's affect downtown uh, office vacancy is the tech rack. Because technology was absorbing every piece of space up until kind of 2021. And all of a sudden, large tech said, it's, we need a timeout. We've overhired um, those people all working remotely. We don't even know what they're doing. We hired 40,000 people or 80,000 people. We don't even know what they're doing. So they are all taking a pause, so trimming all their office space and so on. Um, and and uh, but technology will be back. Um, and financial institutions are strong, and you know, people are. Uh, while there will always be some remote work element, um, the fact is, by the main, most businesses realize you have to have people together to create culture, collaboration, actually run a business, have innovation. I mean, when you see even Zoom calling its people back to the office. You know, there is a message there. You have one of the most significant LinkedIn posts, bar none, in real estate. Uh, whenever you post a story about the fact that people are coming back to the office and that offices are, uh, in, in fact, you know, uh, thriving with once people are, are back and that people aren't leaving because they're being asked to come back to the office. What is your response to those on the other side who say work from home is here to stay? You people who think that, uh, uh, you know, people want to go back to the office are yesterday's dinosaurs. Uh, you know, the fact that remains that work from home is very successful and productive and so on and so forth. And those are over here. And then over here are the, the ones who have people back in the office like yourselves and where, as you say, the culture and, the, and, and so on thrive. How do you reconcile these two very significant differences? Well, People that think they can work from home exclusively better be careful for what they wish for because their competitive frontier on the remote side includes people from Manila, Delhi, and Shanghai, and Cleveland. So um, it's a very rare breed that has got such a globally competitive skill. Um, you, know, our, you know, we're a big consumer of legal services. So one of our law firms, um, you know, was having a difficult time getting their people to come back to the office. And we were finding, and we keep about a dozen people at this one firm busy every day. And we we're finding increasing mistakes, ankle biters, but just increasing mistakes. So <laughs> we said, uh, we're actually going to move our business to a firm in Winnipeg because they're all together and they charge half the price. Um, and if, you know, because what's, what's the difference whether you're, um, if, it's, if, if we can only contact you remotely, the Winnipeg guys are just fine. So turns out the next day, all 12 were in the office. Because apparently the partner said to them, you can stay home if you want. You just have to find a new customer. Oh, business development. I didn't think I had to do that. Um, and guess what? You know, they're now all collaborating. The mistakes are gone. And, and you know, in, in when you're doing complex transactions, if you change one document that you're doing, it affects another document you're doing and another one you're doing. And if you're remote, the communication is imperfect. If you're together, it, it works. So um, uh, I think that, I, I think we will go, we'll, we'll move from, my view of the world is before the iPhone 2007, um, 
you know, typically your office day ended at 5 or 5.30, and, and that was that. You wouldn't communicate with a coworker, a supplier, um, you know, a customer, whatever, after that hour until the next day. Um, and Friday at 5.30 or 5, you know, that would be it until Monday. Um, all of a sudden, with the, with the incursion of the iPhone and sort of the omnipresence of email, everybody's getting emails 24-7, and there's an expectation that if you got the email at 7, you know, should you respond to it? Or for sure, if you got it on, you know, Saturday, should you respond to it? So on and so forth. So um, I think that's changed the model so that um, what businesses like ours are doing, and I think, I think what we're doing will actually be increasingly common, is our policies is work from the office Monday through Thursday, and Friday is work from anywhere, um, except for four Fridays a year tomorrow being one of them, which is our pre-board book weeks, where it's like crazy and all hands on deck. Um, and, and that's actually, I think, worked pretty well in our shop. And uh, it respects the fact that um, for most people in leadership, you're working in the office four days a week and you're working remotely three days a week, um, you know, at some element. It's not like you're working all day, but, you, you know, you, you, there's always a little bit of email and so on and so forth that you deal with. Um, and I think that's where businesses will end up. If you're competitive, if you're in a competitive business or an innovative business or a creative business, um, you know, what happens when you walk down the hallway matters. And you can't walk down the hallway and Zoom. I mean, for me, how I built a business, super simple. I eat lunch five days a week with someone else. I have breakfast three days a week without my wife, in other words, with someone else. Eight occasions a week, 50 weeks a year, 400 times I was able to prospect um, and build a relationship, reinforce a relationship. And, it, you know, over a sandwich or over a muffin for breakfast, um, it's very different than trying to say, can we have a scheduled Zoom call? So um, I wouldn't say I ate my way to the top, but it was sort of like that. And, and uh, you know, I didn't do dinners because I had kids. And, you know, I, you know so I was always at home for dinner. But the, the, uh, I did the other, the other meals, um, and, um, which is another thing that I would express to people, which is to say, if you, can, if you can, and this is the hardest thing to do, if you can have lunch with somebody else every day of the week, and it doesn't have to be a targeted strategic prospect or something, just anybody. It could be a neighbor, a lawyer, a friend, a cousin. Just have lunch with somebody else every week or every day of the week. It's a huge pathway to building the relationships and ecosystem. Then in Canada, it's quite small. And, you know, we're not, I mean, the U.S. is a super huge market, and you'd have to have lunch 25 days a week to sort of have any impact, um, which, of course, that's 25. That doesn't work. Um, but it, it is, in Canada, is a small system. And in real estate, you know, I like to say we're all in the shallow end of the gene pool. People don't get out. Um, and it, it is a uh, community community and actually a very supportive, wonderful community. Um, and people that build relationships, treat people with respect and so on, really build a career and build a business. John, changing uh, topics and uh, asking you just one very brief one. You own a number of super regional shopping malls among other retail. Um, you know, during COVID, everybody was of course focusing on online. But since COVID has virtually died down, what has changed with brick and mortar? You know, are people back in the stores? Have retailers changed what they do today and what they were doing in 2019? Yeah, so totally. I, I, I'll give you uh, just a couple sound bites. One is the last regional shopping center opened in Canada was in 2004, Vaughn Mills. Population of Canada at that time is 32 million. Today it's 40 million. No new regional malls. And you won't see another regional mall because the model's broken. The old model was you buy a farm, you get two department stores, you get the city to rezone it, and you're good to go. Well, there aren't two department stores. You can't rezone a farm. And so that model's broken. So the existing supply is fixed. Then <clears throat> if COVID flushed out, the weaker retailers. So if you didn't have a robust business model or a robust vision, it, it, it flushed you out. So when we're able to open again 
And trust me, closing down a mall and sending all those people home is traumatic for the mall owner, obviously the business owners, and obviously the employees. Anyway, once they opened again, rejuvenated. So today, if, if before COVID, um, you know, a uh, retail store in a mall tended to be a point of purchase, you go there to buy something. Today, the strategy forward retailers recognize there's four rules for that mall. First is point of purchase. Second is a return depot. And the return depot saves you money on those returns. And you almost always sell something to somebody when they bring it back. Third is brand development, the physical presence and expressing physically what that retailer has to offer. And the fourth, fourth is last mile fulfillment. I mean, you'll know if you buy something from Apple um, that you can say on your distance from the Eaton Center store and they'll give you a uh, two hour delivery or next day delivery or whatever, but they'll give you two hour delivery. So a Lululemon, you go into a Lululemon and you know, you'll see there's no customers in the store, but there's this, the, the store clerk is taking stuff off the shelf, putting it in a bag box and, and the courier and off it goes. Last mile fulfillment. Best Buy has really was pioneered this concept um, as they reinvented their uh, business 10 years ago. So um, the malls today, the better malls, have never been more full. Um, the rents are um, not what they were. Okay, So all the rents got a downdraft in 2019 and through COVID and so on and so forth, got a reset. But NOIs are, are back to, to being northbound. And in our business, you know, they're uh, the malls have never been so full and income's over budget and income over budget is a happy place. So, um, and you know, we see further growth there. So I'm, I'm a very big bull on uh, good regional shopping centers. Sounds great. Have to ask you a question about housing. It's getting unprecedented attention everywhere across Canada for obvious reasons, because you either have the affordability issue of owning a condominium or low-rise uh, house or townhouse or whatever, or you have the issue with the affordability of the rents in the apartments or condominium condos or, or what have you. You recently addressed the Canadian Senate uh, committee on this matter. What is your view of this issue? Are governments finally taking this so seriously that they're all, at all three levels that they're doing unprecedented uh, initiatives to try to address this? Or is it still smoke and mirrors and they're not quite there yet? So um, I, I think the housing crisis is an existential crisis because the whole affordability issue um, is, is a severe problem. Um, and it affects everybody. And when I say that, um, if you, even if you own a home and you're, you, know, you, you can afford that house, it affects everyone you deal with, it affects society, it's a destabilizer, it's an existential problem. Um, and it didn't happen overnight. It's through basically two generations of poor public policy. Um, and the, because we simply have constrained supply excessively. Um, and while we continue to grow as population through natural growth as well as immigration. Um, you know, and, and to be clear, I'm a big fan of immigration. I think we need to do the immigration. We need, we need the jobs, but we need to do a few things differently. Um, one is immigration. We have to target more people that are in the trades. Um, and while, while STEM, has been the sort of the classic target for immigration. We need people that can carry a tool. We need people that can build things. Um, we also need to have a national strategy with in our high schools to encourage students to consider making their career in the trades. Um, and I assume all of you know uh, the economic bandwidth of what it's like to be a trade in Toronto. Uh, but for some reason, we never talk about that because if you decide you want to be an electrician or a, you know, a, an HVAC mechanic or a carpenter or whatever, you know, that by the time you're 21 or 22, you've got a six digit income. Um, if you get a friend, not a friend, you hire someone and then you put your name on the truck, uh, you'll be a $200,000 a year person. 
Um, and you know, there's huge economic opportunities for, for youth because there's so much demand. And we need to encourage young people to take those roles. And it's incumbent upon all of us to respect people that are in the trades. So it's immigration. Second is that um, we, you know, we have got uh, regulatory paralysis on new housing. Um, and we have a, a super lack of alignment from the top of the house politically to the bottom of the regulations. And, and so while there is political consensus around the need for more housing, it can't get through the regulatory machine. And let me just give you a couple examples. Um, and, and I should say that every existing politician knows every incumbent's got a target on their back over this issue. So whatever level of government you're at, um, if you can't make demonstrable progress on housing, you'll get turfed at the next election. So I think every incumbent is in trouble uh, and will be for some time. But here's the problem. So let me just give you a, a simple example. A month ago, uh, Premier Eby in province of BC comes out with a strategy to encourage um, more um, uh, secondary housing. So, and secondary housing, I think, is a huge piece of the puzzle, which is someone making their basement available uh, or, or they've got a, a, you know, something in their attic or they've got something in their garage, making those suites, secondary suites, available for rent. And in many cases, that'll be affordable housing. It'll be a basement suite. That people, I mean, that's what I lived in when I went to university. And people like you might live there now. Um, but, it, you know, it can attract all, uh, be a solution for all sorts of people. So he comes out with a strategy to encourage more secondary suites by saying, we'll lend a homeowner, 40,000, Vancouver homeowner, $40,000 interest-free to help them renovate their basement or whatever for a secondary suite. And of, and of course, you know, I put this up on LinkedIn. I think this is great. So turns out, though, that the enabling legislation says, once you get to page 76, that to qualify as a homeowner in Vancouver, you have to have a household income under 200,000. Okay, so guess how many people own a house in Vancouver and have household income under 200,000? And the number starts with near no, nearly no one. So the regulations take away what the policy put out there. I'll give you another example, which uh, isn't on housing, but just illustrates a point. Um, the, the Liberals put together a uh, policy and a strategy for $10 daycare, which I think is a very good strategy because it helps um, you know, mothers um, and fathers, but you know, participate in the workforce at an affordable rate. Uh, in other words, the $10. So that's part of the affordability issue. Uh, so this is great. Page 76 of those regulations say that the daycare has to be sprinkler. Well, we all sit here and say, well, I guess that's reasonable, right? How many daycares do you think there are in Newfoundland that have sprinklers? None. So doesn't apply to Newfoundland. So we need alignment on these issues. For sure, you know, Olivia Chow got elected on saying we're going to make your life more affordable. Nobody knows what that means, but it certainly sounds good. She had the right message. Um, it's just she can't get it through the machine. And, you know, Ford through the machine and Trudeau through the machine. And by the time what I think are forward-looking policies get all their rules and regulations, can't get it done. We've got an affordable housing project. We've got an affordable housing fund. We can raise as much money as we want for our affordable housing. Anyway, we're working on a project in Etobicoke, affordable housing fund. And, you know, one of the big issues uh, that was a delay was the issue about how much parking. Now, this project is across the street from school. It's a block away from a grocery store, and it's on public transit. Why are we having a fight about parking? We want, to, we want to provide less because we think our customer maybe doesn't have a car. It's affordable housing. And the difference between doing one level of parking and two levels of parking through the pro forma offside, because parking, of course, is where residential economics go to die. And <laughs> we finally got the exemption. But you would think, you know, we were trying to bury nuclear waste under the building. Um, so... This is where there's not alignment. Now, let me give you an example where there was good alignment. You know, Ford in COVID said, 
we need to build a long-term care facility and fast, uh, 100 units. So Ford government got together all the stakeholders and they built a 10-story, 100-unit uh, long-term care facility in 11 months. Why? Everybody was aligned. All the regulatory issues, all of the, you know, the construction, the regulatory, the owners, they were all aligned. They got it done. So it's not that we can't do these things. It's that the lack of alignment and the regulatory gridlock gives us things like the crosstown, where, and not that I want to digress on that, but we're here. So the crosstown is a, now in the year 13 on a four-year project. And when I say a four-year project, that's how long it would actually take to build if there wasn't all of the morass. But then when you see these new stations, which are pretty temple-ish, right? I mean, they're, you know, they're beautiful and, you know, like some architect is pretty happy with them. What surrounds most of the sites? It's parking. Okay. Now, how was it, if it was me, they would be incorporated into an apartment building on every stop. Why? because all of us would love to live on a subway, A. B, it creates revenue for the crosstown, and C, they don't have to build this beautiful artifact. So why didn't that get done? Well, different department. So it is, the politicians are struggling because it's a very complex to get the alignment. But when I talked to the Senate, which by the way, was a super cool experience, First time I'd ever done that. Anyway, I have a lot more regard for the senators. These, these people worked hard, well-researched, good questions. So I give them full credit. Um, but, you know, we need alignment. And the alignment has to come from the politicians through the regulations and the enabling legislation. And, and that has proved elusive. And that's what has to change. Last question. So if your son or daughter were graduating from uh, uh, university today, would you encourage them to go into commercial real estate or would you encourage them to do something else? Well, <clears throat> you know, commercial real estate is a super interesting, creative, diverse uh, industry. Um, it is collaborative. And it relies on, here's, here's, here's your test. To be successful, it relies on values, relationships, and soft skills. You know, if you, you all wouldn't be here if you didn't have a certain amount of IQ, and you all have enough. It's the EQ that will separate the winners from the losers. It's a high energy business, lots of creativity, um, and uh, I've found my career to be fascinating because been presented with so many different opportunities to do creative and innovative things. And again, you know, real estate, you know, we're not looking for the cure for cancer. We don't have a trademark over, um, you know, some particular IP. In fact, there is no IP. It's even more interesting. It's who you are. And when I say that, it's not what your last name is. It's what your brand is, you know, who you actually are. Because if you've got the interest and the values and the energy, there is so many interesting opportunities. The last question which George was gonna ask me is where do you get, how do you start a, your career in real estate? And I always say the same thing, take any job because it doesn't matter where you start. It all teaches, it all builds your toolkit. And sometimes people spend too much time trying to be strategic about that first job. Forget about that. As, as I told you, I was, the two jobs I wasn't going to do, you know, and where did I end up? So, <clears throat> you know, when in doubt, take a job. You'll learn something and just keep learning. And, um, you know, life is an amazing place on where it can take you. So thank you very much for your time today. Th thank you. And <clears throat> Thanks very much, John. And I wonder if... if there's time for maybe one question. If anybody would like to ask a question of John before we break off for today. Of course, the report. <laughs> uh, so do you think that housing for students, uh, especially in areas like downtown, will become more affordable in the future? Well, I mean, 
you know, it is, uh, I think housing of all forms has to become uh, more accessible, more affordable, more inclusive. Um, and it, it's a huge industry, uh, a huge issue for, for everyone uh, from the political environment, um, you know, and the industry is, uh, has the skills, the capital and the energy to solve these issues and to attack these issues. We just have to have the regulatory support to do it. Um, and it is, it's, that's where it's super difficult, um, you know, getting just permission. Because it is, it's not, I mean, <laughs> my societal view is it's not constructive. If, if students, you know, uh, are excessively challenged because of student housing, but it's beyond that. And then once you graduate, you've got to get employment housing. And, and you know, the, the, there's, there's all sorts of elements that contribute to uh, what we need to do. Uh, but what we for sure as a society do is we, we've got to figure out how to work together, have, to have that alignment to make housing more affordable and more inclusive, more sustainable for everyone. Gentleman there. Uh, I, uh, so this is about the, um, having lunch with someone different every single day. So I really like that idea. So my question is like, how do you, how, how did you go about that when you would, uh, like how, how would you have lunch with someone different every single day, right? So, um, what I would do typically is I would, uh, write down on a list of paper, uh, a piece of paper in the old days, right? You, you know, now you do it on your iPhone, but, um, just names of people that, um, I hadn't seen for a while or neighbors or just anyone. And, and I phone them up and say, you're free for lunch. Could you do Tuesday or Thursday? You get Thursday done and Wednesday and then next week, Tuesday. And, um, I'm always sort of a week ahead. And, um, I still today, I, it, it would be rare that I don't have a lunch date with somebody else. And I do today. Um, and so just write a list and it, it can be, you know, like, just to get in the practice of networking, um, just just try and pick different people. And while we're on networking, can I just offer two things? Every school, every business school says you got to network, and every student checks that off on the list. But nobody says how to network. So I'll offer two thoughts. If you're going to have lunch with someone or a coffee with someone, or you're going to meet someone, have two things in mind. One thing that you can offer them and a question you might ask them. So the thing you're going to offer them could be anything. You know, you, you saw the, uh, you know, the Leafs got thrashed four to one. Did you watch that game? Uh, it could be something you read in the newspaper this morning because you saw that, um, um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank from what I read in the newspaper this morning or something you saw on social media. It doesn't matter. It could be something that that's of interest to you that you might think that you might have an insight on for them. So let's say, appreciate you saying that. That was of some value to me. And then you might say to them, what's, new with you and it may be your life or your business depending who the person is or something ask them a question people always love to talk about themselves you know case in point but people always like to talk about themselves and if you can ask someone a question get them talking you'll learn some things you'll pick up some things and you may find some areas of common interest or collaboration or you, you never know where it flows so have something remember networking is an exchange of value you make sure you have something you have an observation and you know, like I have young people come see me or people see me read the goddamn website before you see me. Um, and so, you, you know, you should know, I saw there was a press release. You did this or I, like whatever it is. Um, and, and so show some interest in the counterparty, but so, you know, that that's just a little bit of practice. And in today's world, if you're having lunch with someone, you can do that on your iPhone on the walk over. Right. Uh, so it, it's not, it's not like it's difficult. But it, remember, it's an exchange of value. But it, it is, write a list of people you know. And, and if, if you don't know, you could phone people like, where do you go? Where's your professor? Right there. Phone him and ask him for lunch. I'll bet he says yes. Um, and I don't know whoever else is here. And phone them and ask, ask them for lunch. But, but for the most part, it's mainly just people that you know, you're, you're familiar with, right? Like you don't just go up to them. Like, have you ever gone up to a random person on the street and just asked for lunch or? I wouldn't say a random person on the street, but I have phone, I have for sure a cold called people for lunch, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't stand, you know, Young Dundas Square wouldn't be my prospect spot just between us. But um, although the guy you, you, you take to lunch may be very grateful. But um, 
Uh, I think it can be, you know, people in other classes. It could be people that, you know, your, your, your brother or sister knows, or I don't know. Like it, it, I, I'm not being very constructive because I want to, it should be a very broad gathering that. Um, and, uh, and often they'll say, do you mind if I bring so-and-so? Or you met someone at a social occasion, we should have lunch, right? Um, whenever they have a university, you know, like a club that people get together, like that's a super hunting zone. Hi, my name's John and blah, blah, blah. What do you, we should have lunch sometime. Okay, great. Right. Take her to lunch. Find out what she's writing about. One question. John, in the last 100 years, Canada never built more than 2.4 million homes in any decade, starting from 1919 to date. But in 70s, we built 2.3 million homes when the population was roughly 24, 25 million. How did we do that? Small number of population, less investments, less investors, fewer trades, but still Canada built 2.4 million homes in the 70s and never got to that number ever again. What was that different? What was different at that time that we forgot to do after that? Thank you. Well, it was, first of all, it was the big apartment boom. So, okay, so that, that, that was a big part of the numbers. We had the trades and we had permission. I mean, you know, in 1980, uh, you know, in Etobicoke, I, want, I had to get a building permit to expand our little house. And I said to the guy, so what's the process? He said, oh, I just go and get it. So he left. An hour later, he had it, a building permit. Oh, and then on he went. You know what you have to do today? You know, public hearings. Christ, it's two years. So it's, you know, we have, we have throttled the capacity to build, uh, to build housing. We are short of trades. We're short of labor. We're short of trades. Um, but beyond that, we are hyper short of permission. We're not short of land. Uh, I don't believe in sprawl because that's a super inefficient and unsustainable solution to a city. But if you were to take a helicopter over, you know, what is defined as the GTA, you'd say, there's a lot of land here because there is. But to get permission to build on it is excruciatingly difficult. Today, it takes us four years from assembling a site to get uh, permission to build it. And, and today, you go to City Hall. Actually, you don't go to City Hall anymore because people in City Hall don't go to City Hall. It's crazy difficult to get planners who are all gone. So it, it's, a different, it's a different world. We have to blow up the regulatory gridlock. We have to say to ourselves, where is the alignment? Are we actually interested in more density? Now, one of the challenges for the politicians is you know, every resident says, I'm all in for more housing, just not, not near me, right? So that's the famous NIMBY issue, which is super difficult. Um, you might have seen a while ago that a daycare in Vancouver had 12 kids. They wanted to expand it to 18 kids. They had to get a license. The neighbors objected. There, it went through a year, and they ultimately got declined. This is a daycare wanting to go from 12 to 18 kids. Most of us think daycares are... Um, Portion, an important social infrastructure, but it shows you the depth of the problem. So um, we need leadership. We need leaders to stand up and say, uh, political leaders to stand up and say, housing is a crisis, affordability is a crisis, supply is the answer, we've got to blow the machine up. We have to be, we, if, if we want to build more houses, we have to build more houses. And it has to be, it can't all be point towers, right? I mean, it has to include townhouses and single-family homes and, you know, fourplexes and 12-story buildings or six-story buildings, whatever. Sorry, can I just ask one? Yeah. To that, uh, to that can, yeah. Could this be the last question, if that's okay? I'm okay if you're okay. No oh, you, you got things to do. I'm oh, okay. no, no, no. No, I'm not in a rush. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Okay. Um, in regards to what you were just saying, um, and also in the commercial space, in the commercial development space, as our population is growing uh, through immigration and, and natural uh, growth, and more jobs or different types of jobs are coming in, different types of um, workers are coming in, how do, we see, how do you see with your experience in the past and also projections for the future? 
where do you see commercial development going? What type of commercial development do you see happening within uh, the Canadian space or the you know the GTA right. space? Right. Um, how does that shift from what we have been building before, or how we build it, um, where we build it? Um, what do you see? Um, because as you know, from someone that lives outside the GTA or around the GTA, I do see a lot of different types of commercial. Uh, within residential areas being built now, specifically manufacturing or industrial or warehousing. Uh, my, my question is, where do you see us going with commercial development uh, in the near future, in the next 10, 20 years? Yeah, well, <clears throat> um, more people need more everything and places to work, shop, play, recreate. And what you're seeing is a significant, I mean, Canada has got the highest population growth rate in the OECD. Um, and, uh, you know, you might have seen uh, the uh, announced immigration targets today. Um, are they going to stay at the 500,000 people level, which is, you know, it's a big number. Um, and like, I'm all in. That's, I think that's a good, I think that's a good solution. Now, more people need more everything. Obviously, obviously, we've talked about housing, we, we need an extraordinary amount of housing. Um, but there'll need to be more industrial because there's, there's just more activity. There'll need to be more retail, because again, you know, there's more uh, activity of every kind. Um, I think office is probably gonna be quiet for a while, right? And, uh, um, and you know, but, but you know, everybody, the, I've been through three times when office is dead, right? So this is just the third time. So, you know, office is not dead, but it's gonna be quiet for a while. Um, I think you'll need uh, significant social infrastructure. We haven't really talked about social infrastructure, but it is, we're massively underinvested in social infrastructure, uh, which ranges from redefining what a school is. I mean, we remember a school in Toronto has always been four acres of land with a two story building. Well, that's not a school of the future um, because we don't have four acres of land anymore. And, and where are we gonna put all the, the students? So we have to look at other high density cities and say, how do they do schools? It's like. Would you ever imagine having, uh, you know, a university uh, on top of a uh, Canadian Tire store? Like, who came up with that, right? But that's 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 a very progressive, forward-looking, uh, you know, concept. Which obviously Ryerson, as 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 a high-density campus or in a high-density area of the city, embraces. Um, but there's beyond that. I mean, like, just think of where we need to be in, in hospitals. Uh, and, and uh, you know, places of worship. And it's, it's all the elements of, of social infrastructure. So I would say everything needs to be developed. But if you're interested in the development business, get a job that's customer facing. Because if you don't understand what the customer values, it's hard to create something that you think the customer values. So a customer facing job is a leasing job or a property management job um, because nothing tells you more about the world than customers. And no matter what business you're in, if you have the opportunity to be in a customer facing job, that's the most important part of building your toolkit. And uh, that's where I started, of course. I started leasing and of course, you know, you, you do a bunch of that and you realize that, that customers value things that are perhaps different than what you thought. And that's how you develop an asset, reposition an asset or, or invest in an asset to deal with those needs. You got a mic. Oh, there we go. Um, so it's clear that you have a lot of experience in real estate. And so I was wondering. That's just because I'm old, which is fine, which yeah, is fine. Whole, I mean, that's what you were talking about. So uh, how would you recommend students go about uh, purchasing real estate, uh, like housing, uh, in areas like DT and downtown and in areas in the city in general? Yeah, so I, you know, giving giving advice wouldn't be my first choice, but I am here and I'll do it. Um, I think that the best investment value are in the areas that are the most difficult to buy. The most, if if you ha if you have an area that is likely to have bidding wars, go win one of those. Um, you great real estate is is got. Um, is in a high demand area. When I look at commercial real estate, um, we value it on the base of tenant liquidity. What that means is how difficult is it to replace the tenants in that space at the moment? So if you're, 
And you have to know that if you're on a, in a store at the corner of, you know, uh, Young and Dundas, um, say the northeast corner, just to pick one, um, that has to be a high demand location, right? Um, which is very different than if you're on Highway 7 and 404. Um, so if you're thinking of residential real estate, it should be the same thing. What, what, you know, amenities, transit, uh, proximity, neighborhoods, schools, depending what you're what you're doing. And um, you never pay. This is this is the most important thing I'll say in real estate is you never pay too much for good real estate and you always pay too much for bad. And so um, if I was advising a young person, I'd say, you know, if stretch for something better, get the get the apartment on the corner versus in the middle of the building. Get, get the one with the better view versus the non-better view. There's always a better investment. And yes, you got to pay a little bit more, but that'll, that'll be a better investment over time. And at the end of the day, housing is really partially investment, but also it's, it's who you are and where you live, right? So, you know, first and foremost, it should suit your personal for, or familial needs, what, you know, what, whatever it is. And, and, and that should be the prime focus. Just want to come back to your question just for one second. We're building in a, a Tobico through our um, charitable foundation, a 50 unit uh, apartment building that's going to house uh, some indigenous individuals, uh, a 35 uh, home, home, well, let's say 35 houses uh, that are geared to people that are deaf blind and the remainder for low income. We had issues with the costs of this particular uh, development, like John has discussed, and we ended up having units prefabbed in an industrial building in Brantford, put on a flatbed truck, brought over to the site, and like a Lego system, put up this way. Less trades, lower costs, greater efficiency.